Oh, man. That's, whew. We, uh, we, we try not to take ourselves too seriously here. Uh, hopefully, you get that. Uh, we're, we're not a big deal, Jesus is. And man, I'm just, I'm so glad that y'all are here with me this morning. Um, we are talking about humility and, uh, we're going to dive into that right now. But first let's start off with, uh, some scripture and we'll get right into it. Philippians chapter two, verses one through four say this. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any affection and mercy make my joy complete. By thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. Would you all pray with me this morning? God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my friends who are here today. And God, I just ask that as uh, we come before you in this space, Lord, that Um, you would open up our hearts a little bit, God, that we would be ready to receive what you might have for us. God, in, in these moments, um, you, you seek to tell us something, God, you seek to give us a word. And so Lord, I just pray that for each of us, whatever we walked in here with, whatever baggage, whatever weight, Lord, would you just, would you reach out and, and, and lower our walls, God, lower our defenses, help us to to hear what you have to say to us this morning, God, that I would get out of the way, that it would just be uh, your words and your will. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen, y'all. Hey, so my name's Jake. I think I told you before, but my name, I'm, I'm the bridge student's pastor, so I get to hang with you guys sometimes in here. And uh, I got a couple stories about humility that I think you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna probably laugh at. Um, when I feel like, you know, it's time to talk about humility or patience is another one, right? Like when people are like, oh yeah, I'm just praying for patience. People are like, no, 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 don't do that, right? <laughs> don't do that. You pray for patience, God will make you more patient. <laughs> and he will send ways in which you will learn to be more patient and that can be a little bit painful. And so uh, I remember when I was first starting out in ministry, I was interning at my, my first church, the church that I found my faith at, uh, and I was interning in the student ministry. And that's why, one of the reasons why I love student ministry is because I got, I found my faith there. I got to start out there. So I, I got a lot of love for student ministry. Uh, and I've been in it for, gosh, darn near 13 years now. And so one day on a Sunday night, I was in charge uh, of helping prep the lobby, right? My job was to help kind of make the space look nice. We had all these chairs to stack and talk about learning humility, right? Like stacking 500 chairs every Sunday and then unstacking them. That'll teach you a little bit of humility. But I, I, I was walking out in the lobby and usually uh, Pete, our executive director, number two guy at the whole church, he would come on Sunday nights. We had Sunday night service for the whole church. He would come and he would, he would pick up the trash. He would like pick up all the, all, all the little extra trash pieces and take out the trash. Now this might not sound like a big deal to you, but uh, the, the lobby looked completely clean other than these things every Sunday. And these were not your normal trash cans. They were like the really like little skinny guys, like the trendy looking ones. Like, why do we even have those? They don't even, <laughs> they don't even work. You put like three water bottles in there and all of a sudden they're overflowing. And so they always looked horrible. And I would come out and check and I'm like, oh, huh, Pete hasn't like come through here yet. You know, and I'm, I'm go back inside. I'm like doing my prep work, whatever, setting them chairs, blah, blah, blah. Come back out. Uh, oh man, like Pete hasn't come through yet. He usually comes here by now. And so, you know, I'm going back and forth. And as I'm looking for Pete, uh, our, our, our worship pastor, her name was Andrea. She, she walks in and she turns the corner and she sees me. And she goes, Hey Jake, you're right. And I'm like looking around for Pete, like a lost little deer or something, you know? And, and I'm like, Oh yeah, I just, I don't know where Pete is. Like he usually, he usually takes out the trash, not realizing how absurd that sounds. <laughs> and me not realizing the silliness of my explanation. Uh, she, she goes, Oh, well, I can show you how to do that. Andrea, not only one of the kindest people, but also one of the most respected people I've ever been around. I mean, she, she is one of the most front-facing people in ministry that I've had time with and, and incredibly respected by so many people. But, but she saw no problem with helping me get all the trash together and take it out and showing me how to take the thing off. And in and, and all of her graciousness, she taught me that, you know, job descriptions, they're not an excuse to not do the dirty things sometimes. She could have said, that's not my job. She could have said, good luck with that. 
but she chose instead to model humility by not seeing herself as better than any one job. And this story marked me forever. I learned really quickly in ministry that if you view yourself as higher than a specific job, your ego is actually running the show. Your ego is actually running the show. And, and while I was interning at the church, here's another story. Jamie and I had only been married somewhere around a year. And I found out that first year of marriage, that being married shows where your selfishness is very quickly. <laughs> Any married people in here with me agree? Like it, it was fast. And so I remember one night we had just been married for a few months and, and, and we had been arguing about money. That's what we always came into argument over those first couple of years because we were poor. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were not bringing in any like amount of money that was going to sustain us for the long term. And we saw our little savings that we had wearing down more and more because I didn't know how to save. I didn't know how to spend well, and we weren't making enough. And after this long conversation about how important it was that we'd be smart and that we're running out of margin and that this budget, we need to work this budget, right? What do, what do I do? I'm like, whew, that was some work. And I go and get a breakfast burrito. And I go out, and I'm like, I deserve this, man. I go by, and I, I walk back in, holding my food. And you would not have believed the face Jamie made. She looked at me. I mean, that burrito must have been like me flipping off my wife. I mean, the face she gave me. She was like, we just talked about this. And I'm like, oh, you're right. I don't know. I don't know what to do. And there was no real resolution that night. I, I messed up again. And it took me even longer to learn how to not be selfish with our money. I'm not, I'm not proud of those days, but I'm proud that I, that I grew from them and I, and I learned my lesson through all that. But I obviously have, have no shortage of stories where I became aware of my own selfishness and pride. But, but this last story really resonates deeply with me when I think about how I had to grow out of my own self-centeredness. Uh, Jamie and I have always been in ministry together, always. In fact, this is the first church we've gone to that we haven't both worked at together. And uh, we both got, had gotten hired, and we're full steam ahead. You know, me being a people pleaser and a people person, I eventually said yes to too many things, and I didn't know how to set aside time for my new family, having been married for just over a year. And one night, it came to a head. It came to a head. I had been out every night of the week for two weeks straight. We had our Sunday night uh, high school group. Monday night, I had school. Tuesday, Wednesday nights, I was leading small groups. Thursday night, I was hanging out with my friends. Friday night, uh, we... Uh, I was coaching a football game, excuse me, and then Saturday night we had plans with married friends, and I get home one night after those two weeks, and I see Jamie sitting on the couch, and you know when you see your partner sitting on the couch not doing anything, just kind of staring off into space, you're like, oh no, <laughs> what, 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 what happened here? Like, what's going on? And I went down, and, and I sat next to her, and she said, I didn't sign up for this. I'm getting your leftovers while everyone else is getting your best. And that was a hard conversation. And what I learned is that my selfishness created division and disunity in our marriage. It created division and disunity in our marriage. In our relationship, I was operating like it was supposed to benefit me. But the inverse should have been true. We got married because we were meant to make each other more like Christ. In our text today, we see Paul writing to the Philippians, and, and Paul came to Philippi in AD 52, uh, 52, about 20-ish years after Jesus was around, because he was urged by a vision of the Macedonian man to come and help them. And Paul's visit is recorded in Acts 16. It's got some powerful moments that show how he modeled humility to them while he was with them. But one thing you need to know in, about the Philippians is that they were proudly Roman, they were proud Roman citizens. Philippi was an institutional colony of Rome, which means they adopted all of Rome's customs and functions as a hugely strategic location, as a resource center, and as a massively important intersection of all of these different paths of travel. And the Philippian town was strategic for Rome. It was also strategic for Paul. See, it's not an accident that he's the most renowned church planner to ever live. He was intentional, strategic, and used amazing wisdom and discernment in how he helped churches sprout and grow. And Philippi, as a Roman vassal state, would be in a situation where Rome would effectively take you, and they would make you their own. And Romans were passionate. 
These were passionate people. There's a reason they were an empire. They were passionate. And, and you have people who were both devotedly Jewish, devoutly Jewish, and other people who were passionate Gentiles, passionate for their own beliefs, for their own religions, for their own customs that are coming together in the Philippian church. But the common denominator was that they were absolutely devoted about who they were and what they had believed. And so Paul had some firsthand experiences with the church in Philippi, and we can see through his writing to them that they were close to his heart. And why he's writing to them, he's responding to a couple different things. When we ask why he wrote Philippians, we see that it was first and foremost a letter of thanks. Paul was writing to them, and he loves them, and he's saying, thank you, thank you. He's thanking them because the Philippians were the only church that he ever accepted a gift from. Paul was a proud dude, and, and, and he was proud of the fact that God provided for him while he was doing all of this important work. He never wanted other people to be able to say, yep, I funded all of Paul's ministry. I get all the credit. He's going, no, 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 the Lord provided. The Lord provided, but he saw it fit to receive a gift from them when they offered. And so uh, the Philippians had sent him a man named Epaphroditus, all right, expecting moms, Epaphroditus, okay? That's uh, just one to think about, okay? But <laughs> Uh, they sent Epaphroditus as a servant who was also bearing the monetary gift for him, but he became deathly ill. And so Paul sent him home as he was writing from prison so that he might not have to suffer as well with Paul in prison. See, this was a really, a really gracious gesture because they had sent him to him going, he'll be with you forever. And Paul's going, no, it's okay. I release him. And Paul wrote to them to also encourage them during their trials. Paul was appealing to unity in the midst of the relational conflicts happening between a couple of key members of those who were trying to stay true to the apostles, the disciples' teachings, and those who were trying to lure them from that truth into heresy, into, truth, into belief that, that doesn't line up with what the scriptures say. And our primary text this morning is where we see him address the problem. Philippians 2, if then there is any encouragement in Christ... If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, be united. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Don't just look out for number one, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. See, selfishness creates disunity and is only cured by humility. Selfishness creates disunity and is only cured by humility. Don't be selfish, but in humility, think of others as more important than yourself. Selfishness creates disunity and is only cured by humility. The singular problem for the Philippine church was that of disunity. That was their biggest problem. That was their, their sole focus of the letter was this problem. And William Barclay writes, it is when people are really serious about their beliefs and that they really matter to them. When people are really serious about what they believe, that they come into conflict with one another. See, selfish ambition is a core cause of disunity. People work to advance themselves rather than the kingdom, rather, rather than God's purposes. Why is that? Because relationships are never successful when we first focus on what benefits us rather than them. Self-serving as a means to an end always leaves us emptier. Isn't that funny? When the goal is to look out for number one, you usually end up feeling less, less filled usually feel more empty. It's clear that people here in Philippi were acting out of some selfish motivations. It's clear, clear as day. And Paul later on in this chapter calls the selfish people dogs. What does that mean? That means these are not like the cute puppies, right? Like on TikTok, okay? <laughs> some of the good stuff on TikTok is the puppies. No, 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 that's not it, okay? These, these were referring to heaps of stray dogs called pie dogs that were everywhere, everywhere, in their towns, they were, they were digging through trash. So when people heard this word, this was the lowest thing that you could call someone. These were referring to, to dogs, animals that were ruthless, selfish. They, they, they scavenged through garbage and they scoured it and, and they were relentless in just getting their appetite filled, looking for any morsel that they could find. And then Paul also calls these people evil workers. 
because they're doing the opposite of the will of God when they think they're working for the will of God. I wonder if that still happens today. And then sometimes there's ambition for our own personal prestige. This is a core cause of disunity. For some, this is more important than wealth. Uh, I don't think we have to look far in society to see how important making a name for yourself has become. And people will do anything to make a name for themselves. And that's partly because it's become easier now than ever before. And with that comes new dangers. But if we're only out to grow our fame, we're making ourselves greater and we're making Christ less and we've got our priorities backwards. See, ultimately, self-centered, self-centeredness is a forceful cause of disunity. It isn't always so obvious that we're preoccupied with being self-centered. Some of us, it, it's brandished on our chest, and others of us, it's more insidious in it, and it's this thing that is just constantly wired in how we think. Oftentimes, we'll go throughout our days always having been concerned with what might happen to us in hypothetical situations. What if they say this? What if they do that? What if this happens that I don't get to do this? And we just preoccupy ourselves with all of these different thoughts that are only affecting us. See, we only concern ourselves with our problems rather than being in community with others. And as Paul writes in Galatians 6, bearing their burdens, bearing one another's burdens. William Barclay also writes, concentration on self means elimination of others. Concentration on self means elimination of others. When we say yes to something, we're saying no to something else or someone. So what's the solution? What's the answer to this? What's the antidote to our selfishness? Paul gives it here in the next verses in Philippians 2 verse 5. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. This is so beautiful. You guys don't miss this. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen, church. That is so good. And, and Paul, what he's saying here, what Paul is saying is that Christ is the ultimate example He's the ultimate example. If Christ didn't have humility, he would have been this self-righteous conqueror that the Israelites expected. They, they, they were hearing from the prophets in, in the Old Testament. You can see that there's a promised Messiah. And they have images of King David coming and conquering Rome, taking over by force, by asserting their dominance and taking back all these things that they thought were theirs. See, Christ without humility is a conqueror that we all expect. But what they get is a peasant baby in a manger. They get this fragile, tiny human who came to earth, who emptied himself so that he could live life experiencing fear, anxiety, experiencing heartache, so that he could look you and I in the eye and say, I know how it feels. See, Christ with humility paints a different picture. He modeled for us a life lived out of humility and meekness, never considering equality with God as something to take advantage of. But he emptied himself. He made himself lower so that he could serve you and I as someone on our level so that we could have an example to follow. See, the core principle here is this. To die is to live. And humility is exalted. To die is to live because humility is exalted. Humility means we are willing to accept that we might be the problem. Humility means I don't need to be the one with all the answers. I had a mentor about a year ago ask me a question. He said, when's the last time you said, I don't know? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. <laughs> True humility says, search my heart, God, and find anything in it that is not of you, like what David prayed. Are you willing to pray, those of us that struggle to be humble, 
that struggle to embrace the humility that God calls us to? Are you and I willing to pray, humiliate me that I might be more like you? Break me down so that I can look more like you? Matthew 23 verse 12 says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Ultimately, this kind of faith, it gives us a paradox. Let me just talk about this. It gives us a paradox. It gives us two things that simultaneously cannot be true and are absolutely true. You look at a paradox and you can't you go, well, I can't be both things. It's like, yeah, you can. How can I be lifted up if I'm lowering myself below those around me? How can I be great if I'm trying to become less? This is the kingdom of God that the first will be last and the last will be first. God takes our idea of success and turns it on its head. And in the process, inverts the goal from self-achievement into sacrificial love. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. And he did all of this through the person of Jesus. We see it all in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the, don't miss this, exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'll say it again. Matthew 23, 12 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Christ humbled himself so that eventually he would be exalted. He would conquer all sin and death, and you and I will have to fear nothing anymore. The opposite of selfishness is humility. The opposite of selfishness is humility. Humility is the consideration of others as greater than yourself. Pastor Andrew said this, and it's so good. And so my real question is this. Are you trying to advance God's work? Or are you trying to advance yourself? Are you trying to advance God's work? Or are you trying to advance yourself? See, Paul, he modeled humility for the Philippians in Acts 16. There's three stories of Paul and Philippi and how he displayed humility versus selfishness. See, he encounters this lady, Lydia, and she was a purple merchant. She was this wealthy woman who was constantly selling her goods, and, and she was essentially royalty. And Paul was going outside the city gates to find a place to pray. Right? This was something where he had himself on a mission, but he encountered a woman who he could see deeply honored God and had questions, and he allowed himself to be disrupted. This religious routine, this routine that was sacred and sacrificial to him, he allowed himself to be disrupted so that he, he, she could hear their, uh, about Jesus, so that she could hear the good news and be baptized. You know that person that's bugging you outside the grocery store when you walk out the doors and wants to talk your ear off? That's this lady. <laughs> Paul humbled himself and he became interruptible. He, he lost his rigidity. He allowed himself to be interruptible. And the next, there was a slave girl with a demon. She was possessed by a demon that allowed her to tell the future. And these people were handlers. She had people who were guiding her and who were using her to make money. And they made a lot of money off of her telling people their future. But Paul and Silas coming to advance the good news of the gospel, they did the thing that they knew would get them in trouble with officials and called the demon out of her so that she could be healed. They knew they would get in trouble for this. But they didn't anyway. And they got imprisoned because of it. They put themselves at risk purposefully. They put themselves in the crosshairs so that someone else could be healed. And then it happened. They got thrown in prison. And while they were there one night, worshiping God in their chains, uh, the Holy Spirit came and swept through and released all of them. All the chains fell off. And everybody's looking around They're like, what just happened? This is incredible. And the Roman guard who had fallen asleep, he heard this and he woke up. And seeing what had happened, he assumed the worst. He, he thought they were all going to run. And so he drew his sword. And he was getting ready to commit suicide. Because if you were a Roman guard and you let your, their prisoners go, that was one of the greatest shames that they could bear. But Paul and Silas saw this happening. They stopped and they go, stop, 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 no, we're not going anywhere. Can you imagine? You're imprisoned falsely. Your chains fall off and you choose to stay. And everyone stayed where they were and were later released. And because of their selflessness and humility, that guard and his entire family were saved and baptized because 
They were selfless. Humility creates unity in relationships. Humility creates unity in relationships. Humility is that missing gear in the mechanism of community that makes everything work as it's supposed to. When we don't have humility, people bump into each other. We bonk our heads on stuff. We get angry. We get bent up. We start peacocking and we get all mad. Our tails get all wild, right? No, no, no. And humility gets put in. We start to work in community as things are meant to. We stop looking out for our own intentions and all of a sudden things work in beautiful harmony. And at church, humility looks like not caring about our own interests. Why don't they play that song anymore? Or my favorite worship leader isn't singing today. Or darn it, they let the youth pastor preach again. (laughs) These are all examples of things that we've thought at one point or another that only revolve around us, around our preferences, around how we wish things were. Humility in the church looks like not getting bent up or twisted when we don't feel like we get the recognition we deserve. I've been guilty of this more times than I can count, church. I just got to be honest with you. And if you really feel shortchanged, then you should have a conversation with someone. But do it out of love and humility, not out of self-serving motivation. And every time I felt like I didn't get the credit I deserved, God used that to show me where I was only looking out for myself and my own interests. He said, yeah, yeah, they might have messed up, but what about you? What do I want you to learn here? Every time I felt like I didn't get the credit I deserved, God used that to grow me in humility. And ultimately, humility in church means serving like Christ so that others can see Christ. It takes humility and selflessness to step out and to serve other people. That's why, that's why, like Pastor Jeff said, we have all these teams that, that are incredible teams because they stepped out in selflessness to serve our church so that you and I could experience all this. Get this, you might be the only Bible that some people read. You might be the only Bible that some people read. That's a big stinking deal. And humility in our own personal relationships that looks even more intimate. In our singleness, when we're single, we decide if we want to embrace humility in a representation of stability or loneliness as a sign of discontentment. These are outward expressions of what's happening internally. Being humble is an outer representation of the internal peace that you are actively experiencing. My single friends, when you have become fully satisfied with Christ is often when he decides to bring the person your heart might desire. It doesn't happen like that all the time, but there's a biblical principle at work that tells us that when we have fully released something to God, that he is then able and free to bring us our desires at the right appointed time. I'm I'm reminded of uh, how when Jamie and I were trying to get pregnant at first, we tried for over a year. And we had all the tests, all the things we were just trying and trying and trying and and nothing. And we had had grown to hold onto it so tightly. And finally, when we released that and we let go of the tests and and the checkup and all these different things. And when we finally let go, that's when God gave us a desire that we so desperately craved. But it wasn't until we fully released it. But ultimately, singleness is an opportunity for us to show the sufficiency we find in Christ. And that leads to humble service and ultimately to God's working his plan in our lives, regardless of what happens after that. Because we know that God is using us. The goal isn't marriage and life. The goal is not marriage. It's holiness in which humility is a distinguished byproduct of. And then in marriage, oh man, Humility in marriage. Sometimes humility in marriage looks like not just going on autopilot. When I get home most nights, I just want to crash. I'll tell you guys, I go hard. I, I, I work really hard and I, and I put out energy. But when I get home, man, I just want to drop my stuff and lay on the couch and check out. But I have to tell myself that when I walk through that door, I'm still on the clock when I get home. Because otherwise, I let myself off the hook for my greatest responsibility, which is my family. Humility. Humility looks like not going on autopilot. Humility also looks like listening well. When we look at our partners, oftentimes we're just sitting there and waiting for them to finish. And I'll tell you, every time that happens to me, I notice. (laughs) And every time that happens to Jamie, she notices. And she'll do the thing, right? You guys have heard this before. She'll go, what did I just say? 
I'm like, oh, the thing, yeah, with the stuff and the people, right? Like, you know, and, 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 you, try, and you try and recover, but humility looks like listening well. They did a study, and, and they had spouses go into this room, and they gave them both jobs and, and uh, responsibilities, and they were facing away from each other. And then they would have one of the partners shout out their partner's name, right? So like, Rick, Rick, or Cindy, or I don't know, insert name here. And, and they judged, the whole experiment was to see if the partner would turn around and look at them. And based off if their partner turned around and looked at them to acknowledge them, they could accurately predict into the 90th percentile if that couple was going to stay together or not. Do you listen to your partner? Man, that's convicting. If we are embodying humility in our marriages, we're listening to our partners and our children like they, what they have matters. What they have to say matters and believing that what they say is important. But in all of our relationships, we have to look to Christ as the ultimate unifier. We are all under Christ and submit to him together as equals. We are all the same before the cross. Christian love creates the opportunity for us to find unity. And we share in the Holy Spirit and how it binds us to God and his will. See, ultimately, you guys, we humble ourselves by taking up the cross and following Christ. By following after the example that he set for us. We humble ourselves by taking up the cross and following Christ. Humility shows an internal confidence that you know who you are and you know whose you are. Humility creates an anointing that works in the deeper trenches of faith that open doors and connections that don't make sense externally. People look at your life and they go, how, how do you have peace right now? But they create the perfect environments for your faith internally. And this stems from the internal belief that God's in charge, that we embrace humility and it creates a specific anointing on people that allows them to transcend the hard environments and to not be broken by them. It creates an internal confidence that allows you to not be broken. And so friends, this morning, I have to ask you, where is God calling you into humility? Where is God looking at you and he's going, I'm giving you a chance to take up your cross. Do you want to follow me? And for you and I, that means laying our selfish desires and ambitions down at the foot of it and saying, yes, God, I'll follow in your son's example. Will you pray with me? God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my friends this morning. And Jesus, I just ask that as we go from this place today, Lord, that we would carry with us the message of humility. God, that in all things that we would be reminded that you are working them together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose for them. And so, God, I pray for each of us that as we continue to step into your purpose for us, God, that we would find that lane, that, pit, that place, that pace of life that allows us to step into the humility that you have modeled for us in Jesus. God, would you remind us that we are not in control? You are. That we need your son's grace and love more than anything else in this world, God. And that when we fully submit and rest in you, God, that's when you can do the greatest work. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 